Very good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. Sixty years ago, in 1956, a 17-year-old schoolboy from this school, Trinity College, wrote an essay entitled The World We Want. This enabled him to be selected as the Sri Lankan delegate to the World Youth Forum held in 1957 in New York, spend three months in that country, meet President Eisenhower, and meet the Senator John F. Kennedy, who went on then to become a future president. This also led to a career in the diplomatic service of Sri Lanka and in the United Nations. Today, 60 years later, this older and gray man would like to tell you about the world as it is in order to equip fellow citizens of Sri Lanka to the changing global scenario so that we can innovate ourselves, reinvent ourselves in order to have a competitive edge in this highly integrated global society that we are in. Despite its size, Sri Lanka has been linked to the global system for centuries. We have had various travelers like Marco Polo and Farsian report to us about Sri Lanka in those days. But even after we were colonized, as the last bastion of Sri Lankan sovereignty, the Kandyan Kingdom received diplomats from the Western world. And we were always connected to the global system. And that is what we should now continue to be connected to because the world has never been more closely integrated and connected than it has been today. And that is why I think it is useful for us to go through some of the evolutionary processes that Sri Lanka and the world has been through in the last few centuries. I think we must go back to the post-World War II situation, when after the bloodiest war in human history, World War II, we had a peace situation arise, with, of course, the Axis powers as being the dominant powers, but more importantly, as a universal rule-based society under the Charter of the United Nations emerging. This was the first time that the quest for a global order succeeded. And 70 years later, the United Nations still exists. And I submit that this is an important civilized world order which we must continue to uphold because the charter of the United Nations represents the rule-based system that we must work under. And where we fail is where we go against that rule-based order. The Peace of Westphalia of 1648 established the nation-state as the fundamental building block of international relations. And relations between nation-states began from that stage onwards. But the period after the World War II was also not only the period of the United Nations, but also of decolonization which enabled a whole group of countries from Asia, Latin America, and Africa to come into the global stage. And they were classified as developing countries. Some of them grouped together in the non-aligned movement, and Sri Lanka was one of the founder members. Others were in the group of 77, which were developing countries, fighting for the democratization of international relations, wanting to end the hegemony of some countries and the dominance of the more powerful countries. We talked about the common heritage of mankind, whether it was the sea or whether it was outer space. This was a new concept. We, the new generation of nations, had a right not only to what had been inherited by the more powerful nations, but what our people were entitled to as being members common humanity. A number of regional organizations were for formed. Now, post-Cold War, of course, a number of situations arose. There was the Cold War, with a strong 
tense relationship between the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact countries and with NATO and the Western countries. And Sri Lanka wisely chose non-alignment as the via media. But in addition to that, there was this ideological tussle between communism and capitalism. This finally ended through imperial overstretch part of the Soviet Union. And we had the Berlin Wall symbolizing the collapse of the Soviet Union through implosion and a liberation of many countries that had been within the common form of the Warsaw Pact. But that was not all. There was a man called Francis Fukuyama who said this was the end of history. This was, of course, a highly exaggerated version which he subsequently recanted, but it was perhaps the end of history for the Western world. In fact, a new era in global relations began. We had the shift of the center of gravity moving from the Euro-Atlantic to the Asian Pacific. And it was not only Hawaii-born President Obama's pivot to Asia that caused it, but it was a natural flow of history. Because as far back as the 18th century, China and India dominated global trade. But it was the change in the system and the exploitation of the global system by the West that resulted in the diminution of those economies, which are now once again resurgent. So we see the rise of Asia and the center of gravity is definitely now in the Asia Pacific. There is also a number of other issues that we must concentrate on, and that is the interconnection between nationalism, which is no longer dead, but it's resurgent in a number of countries, terrorism, and consumerism. And I think these interconnections are very important for us to understand if we are to see what is happening in the global system. Because ex excessive nationalism breeds terrorism, and with the nationalism and the fact that most countries want to develop their economy, you have more and more consumerism, which leads to climate change and other problems. So there are problems that are complex in nature. I think we have to recognize that there is a great deal of extremism in the world, and this comes not only because of the frustration of the nationalist urges in some areas, such as, of course, in Palestine, which is one of the principal areas where there is still unrealized expectations of the Palestinian people since 1948. But there is also the problem of nuclear weapon proliferation. And with the beginning of the Cold War, we have lived under the shadow of a nuclear conflagration. There are today over 15,000 nuclear warheads possessed by nine countries. Two of them, the United States and the Russian Federation, have 93% of them. And each one of these 15,000-odd nuclear warheads has a potential of more than 1,000 Hiroshima or Nagasaki bombs. So it is a frightening situation. We had a scare in 1962 over the Cuban Missile Crisis, but the scare exists every day because a nuclear disaster through accident or through deliberate intent or by a state which has nuclear weapons or even a terrorist group could once again set off a major explosion from which, of course, the entire world will be affected. So we have to be mindful of the dangers of nuclear war. We must also be conscious of the problem of climate change. We had an international panel for climate change, intergovernmental panel, which produced five reports. And the, the, the reports say unambiguously that it is man and human action that is responsible for climate change. Fortunately, in December, after many previous attempts, 
We've had an international conference that have agreed on certain steps to be taken. And if those steps hold, we may save the world from the disaster of climate change. But militarism continues to pose a threat. Today, global military expenditure is in the region of $1,676 billion, of which the United States is responsible for about 40%. I've shown you here the top 10 spenders in the world. And as you can see, we are very far below, but proportionate to our size and proportionate to our economy, we are still far too high, particularly since we have now recovered from the terrorist problem that we had. And we can now go back to recycling our expenditure into unmet social and health needs and education needs of our country. But militarism continues because this is a very strong lobby. And it was President Eisenhower, who was both a general and a political leader, who identified it in 1961 in his farewell speech to the United States, talking about the military-industrial complex. But that military-industrial complex does not exist in the United States alone. It exists in a number of countries, and they wield great influence in the chanceries of power, influencing policies of war and peace. And that is something which we as common citizens in all the countries must resist so that we solve our problems through peaceful means, through diplomatic means. Now, there are economic challenges that we face in the new situation. One of them, of course, is the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals, which came to a conclusion last year, and we were reasonably satisfied. But now we've become more ambitious, and by 2030, we have set ourselves sustainable development goals, 17 of them which are up on the screen there, as you can see, no poverty is a very ambitious goal, no hunger, good health, and the other 17, which are all very important targets that we must, together with the rest of humanity in this world, try to achieve. But we are always faced with the problem of inequality. And the recent theoretical work of a French economist has shown us that inequality can lead to discrimination and can lead to political extremism. And this is what we have to be very, very careful about. Because as long as there is inequality, there is likely to be political extremism. And we have to ensure that we have growth for all. Now, clearly, as I said earlier, Asia has become the powerhouse of the world. And the one belt, one road idea of the Chinese is going to result in the entire Silk Route, the old maritime Silk Route, being developed with its infrastructure. And we have to be careful that the Cold War, which ended in Europe, is not transferred to Asia, and that external powers don't try to manufacture tension between India and China, because that would be disastrous for countries like Sri Lanka. So we have to encourage diplomacy between these two giants who already have a considerable amount of trade between them and who therefore are unlikely to go to war because of the mutual interest prevents them from doing so. We have to learn the lessons of the Cold War in Europe and ensure that Asia is spared such a Cold War. But there are other emerging challenges you all have heard about Davos and the Global Economic Forum. The fact is that they talk about a fourth industrial revolution. The first being, of course, through steam and the locomotive engine, George Stevenson and all that that we studied in school, and then electricity, and therefore after IT and electronics. But now the fourth industrial revolution is a combination of the IT revolution plus a number of other factors, the biological factors, the use of robotics, artificial intelligence being applied to other fields, fusing the physical and the biological. And this 
could cause major revolution in society as well as in the global picture for which we must be ready. Our scientists must be able to take a page from what is happening in other continents and develop it and adapt it to our own needs. We still face globally, because of the interdependent nature of the global economy, the results of the 2008 depression and the problem caused by Wall Street. And this problem, of course, will linger, but we have to be able to adapt our economy to the changes that take place elsewhere so that we are both self-reliant as well as benefiting ourselves from the developments in other parts of the world. Let me also talk about the United Nations, because I think it's important for us to realize that the United Nations remains a framework within which we have to work. We have come to recognize that there can be no security without development, and there can be no development without security. And there can be neither without human rights. So there is a tripod of security, development, and human rights that is important for national security throughout the world. But national security is not the only security. National security looks after borders and the sovereignty of the state. But there is also the question of human security. Because you can have situations in any country where the country may be secure, it has secure borders, but where the individual is very insecure and where he is subject to oppression, torture, and other human rights abuses. So what is ideal is to have human security and national security coinciding. And that is where it is important for us to look at the charter afresh and ensure that the rule-based society, the global order, and the arc of history bends towards this, and that we must share the values and the legitimacy and the universality of the UN must apply to Sri Lanka. I think we have a glorious opportunity to forge a new foreign policy for Sri Lanka. After the terrible paroxysm that we had because of the combat of terrorism for 30 years, we have now reintegrated ourselves with the international order. We can reinvent ourselves as a responsible member of international society. And we can be innovative in our foreign policy because that is what is important now so that we not join any particular group or groups but work in a pragmatic way, non-ideologically, with a foreign policy that is embedded in our culture, in our history, and in our fundamental national interests. And I call upon citizens of Sri Lanka to use this unique opportunity to once again forge a policy which will be of benefit to our country in the current situation. Thank you very much.